Lost. And we're live. Good day, Whiskey Brothers and Sisters. We're honored to have you, the viewer, and our panel with us here tonight. My name's Dol. I'm the president of Alberta Scott Study and founder of the Whiskey Book Club. For those of you that are new to us, I'll explain a couple things. First and foremost, we're a group of whiskey geeks that love to share a dram and share our passion for reading, mostly about whiskey and whiskey-related activities. Our present tome, our third book, this one right here, right there, was inspired initially by our sense of adventure and my long-held desire to do the whiskey trail in Scotland, the bourbon trail with our neighbors to the south. I thought Canada's got so much history. It's got so much whiskey. Why not do our own whiskey bourbon trail and let's call it the Canadian whiskey journey. So that's what we're doing now. So thanks to Blair and Davin's book, which one? This one right here. We have the direction we need, the inside track to the distilleries that we all crave to do our tour. So Davin and Blair, Davin's not here right now. We'll talk about him in a second. We'll talk behind his back actually, because he's not here. But Indeed, they are our spirit guides on this journey across this vast, big, beautiful country of ours. Secondly, we're about the camaraderie that comes along with sharing a dram, sharing a book, and sharing an adventure together. So let's get on with our trek across Canada, our road trip, and get better acquainted with our country and the fine spirits that are produced here. And in the end... Like all previous weeks, we're going to continue the fun with a more relaxed broadcast called The After Dram. It starts five minutes-ish after this broadcast. Gives us a chance to recoup, go to the washroom, get a drink, make our cocktails tonight, and that's what we're going to do. So without any further ado, let's do our roundtable introductions with our names, our other platform handles, as well as what's in your glass tonight. So let's start. Dave, you're good to go? Yeah, sure. Start with you, buddy. Hey, hey it's uh, Yukon Dave coming from his basement again. And he froze. <laughs> and he froze. We'll get to Drinking one of the shelter point ones, but false writing. I can't read my writing. You're doing the mall fall first, and then we're doing the double barrel. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, those two uh, I'll be sampling here right away. Perfect. Uh, Blair, you ready? Yeah, I'm uh, Blair Phillips, co-author of the Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. Tonight, I am taking this to a little bit of a curveball, having a gin and tonic uh, with Shelter Point Gin. It is hot as hell in Toronto right now, um, so I'm taking it easy with this beauty right here. All right. What's the temperature there? Uh, I think it got up to about 365 today. Excellent. Nothing yeah. like melting shoes, eh? And, and yeah. the humidity? All right, Jacob, How's it we're putting you up. Jacob Hi. first. All right, we're going at our first actually drink popcorn right now. And we uh, oh. are Oh, Jacob, you're breaking up a lot on us, buddy. What I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to click out and click back in again, and hopefully that'll fix it just on when when you're doing that. I'm yeah. hearing every five, fifth word, bud. And we'll get two more introductions by the time you come back. Thank you, gentlemen. Kent, you're up. Hi, my name's Kent. I'm Whiskey Ask on Instagram and Facebook, and I'm also doing the, uh, the poorly written... If you can read that, no. <laughs> sorry, no. we all had to. <laughs> my chicken scratches are not that. My wife usually prints it up for them. They are, they, they, they are, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, we, we just had to give you a hard time. So. Uh, of course. I know he's not a doctor. I'm going to block them off now because they're complaining about my writing. They got. <laughs> I'm Dolph. I'm the president of the Alberta Scott Society, and I'm your host tonight. And hopefully, uh, Jacob comes back in right away. We're going to see. And we'll get this running with, with everyone else. So I'll give them like 30 seconds. But at this point, I'm just going to say, uh, Blair, it was, I think you guys are getting record temperatures down east right now, right? For this time of month. It's, 
it's it's warm. I don't know if it's record temperatures. Um, oh, it's just hot, hot and uh, not too humid, but uh, it's getting sticky. Okay. And uh, a little bit of a description of what happened to our dear Davin. Davin had double booked himself at this point. So Davin is at this moment doing a online tasting with the group in Ottawa. Blair, do you remember who they are? No idea. Okay. <laughs> and he said he was going to be back in the half an hour. So yeah, we're going to be here in, Yeah, he'll be here in 20 minutes or so. All right. 7.30 or something like that. If he's not. Mm. All right. And now we're going all the way to Leon and Jacob at Shelter Point. And you look clear. Okay, perfect. Do we sound clear? All right, we're good. We're good? Yeah. So I'm the manager at Shelter Point. This is Leon. Yeah, I'm um, distiller. I've been distilling whiskey and gin today. I'm drinking a new make. Um, so I have no patience for maturation whatsoever. <laughs> drinking the new make. Fantastic. Love it. And uh, do you know what that's going to be made into? Any any thoughts yet? Or it's just in the barrels and you're going to figure it out in a couple of years? This has got a bit of uh, Munich 30L, which is a slightly darker chocolatey malt in there. So... At some point in the next five to ten years, I would imagine this being in the bottle as part of a, a chocolate flavored single malt. Also, like nothing added, like a pure honest whiskey. No, none of this nine percent adding anything else rubbish. No nine point oh nine anywhere. It's just straight across. I got it. We're good. And Leon, uh, uh, distillery manager, yes. Or Jacob, manager. Who did I say? Leon. Leon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> I'll figure this out, gentlemen, pretty quick. And let's go back on the screen and have this all shared up. Uh, I'm going to set the scene for us all, if that's all right. So, so everyone can kind of picture what's going to go on right now. So I'm going to, first of all, put a picture of the distillery. It's a beautiful picture we have up front. And stop, right there. And I'll talk about that for a quick second, and then I'll show you even the map. But So I, let's set the scene. Uh, we've arrived at our second stop for the Canadian whiskey journey. We've all traveled from Vancouver, and we took the, the ferry at Horseshoe Bay. So let's, let's click on there now. Uh, Horseshoe Bay, past the coast of Bowen Island, headed north on 19, and about four hours later, we finally arrive at Shelter Point. We're thirsty for some knowledge and some single malt tonight. Kent, Dave, and I have been to Vancouver Island, but we have never been to Shelter Point Distillery. But we know Blair, and Blair's agreed to get us a top-notch tour with Jacob, the distillery manager, and Leon, which I'm really happy that you're there. So let's click off the map. We don't need we see uh, the questions in our conversation that's going to follow are five people meeting up doing a once-in-a-lifetime tour. It'll be six once Davin gets here. Well, it'll be seven when Davin gets here. Stop looking at the squares. I'll start counting the people, and we can do that. So, and that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's that's where we're putting our head when we're doing these questions. So, we'll figure it out. We're all good. We, Jacob, we should have flown with you. We should have flown into Comox. <laughs> you know what? And we could have and had we could have relaxed a little bit before, but I was anxious. I wanted to get there right away, Dave. Sorry. No, okay. Yeah, no, I was I, dropping. I, I flew into Comox quite often. Your website states that the Evans family bought the land in 2005, but Patrick is a third generation dairy farmer. And I'm, I'm wondering because they bought the farm from, I think it's the University of Victoria or something. Did they own land beside it and just make their land bigger, or were they somewhere else on the island completely before they went over? They were uh, on a different spot on the island, about 20 minutes north. So they bought this farm to expand the dairy operation from uh, milking around 400 cows. And they were planning on milking around 800. Oh, wow. um, Patrick Good. immediately was tired of cows once he got the property and wanted nothing to do with them. So <laughs> and, uh, they went in separate ways. Patrick took this land. One of the brothers took the dairy farm. The other brother uh, went to town. And uh, yeah, five years later, we started construction on the distillery. Beauty. Yeah, well, I think I would do the same thing. I'm not a farm boy, and I like my whiskey, so I think that's a fantastic idea he had. 
Yeah. All right. We're going to go to the YouTube videos that you guys have on your website. So I checked that out. We can see that the tours are free, which we really appreciate as we're coming here today. And that your tour guide, is it still Brian Engel? Yeah, Brian Engel is still the tour guide. The spirit guide, we like to call them. Just like, just like our guys, spirit. That's yeah. fantastic. We're on the same wavelength, guys. Absolutely. All right. Tell us about him because he's supposed to be this big, massive personality. Yeah, he's a, he's an English fella who was just retired on the island. And one day when we opened up the distillery in 2011, he just sort of approached us and said, we don't have a tour program and he'd like to install one. And then he sort of just came from there. And he's been here right from day one. And uh, he's our spirit guy. He's got this magnificent tour and just got it down to a T. He looks like Father Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's nice too. So he just shows up and says, "I want a job. Here's my idea," and you guys yeah. are all good. We're like, "Yeah, absolutely. That sounds great. That's one less thing that I don't have to do." And uh, yeah, he's just for about So Kent, we have to start going to places around us here and start asking just for a job. Dave's already got one with two brewers, so he's he's set. But yeah, I I asked. Well, yeah. We can get our nighttime job. This will be our second job. Let's do some tours. You need us. You want us. We're great people. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's fantastic. Leon, you're breaking up completely, guys. Just barely. I'm wondering if you're you're on Wi-Fi. Is it? Are you really far away from me? Ah, oh, we're we're in the middle ground. Well, you meant, so it should be good. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What were you saying, Jacob? Let's try. No, Leon, let's try that again. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, there was no job advertised. I just looked at the best places to make whiskey on the western side of Canada, and I thought, chill the point. And then I just pestered Patrick and believe me, a job. So you looked at a map, figured this is kind of warm. It's got some nice scenery. I'll work there. Yeah. Yeah. Leon, where are you from in Scotland? Where were you working previous to this? Uh, Really cool gin. And then uh, <laughs> for that, I lived in like uh, for about 15, 20 years. Uh, but I grew up in the island of Scotland, so I was from Athenborn originally, which is a bit like the Whistler of Scotland, but a lot crapper. Yeah. Uh, smaller mountain and much less snow, but yeah, it was good fun. Uh, it's not too far from Spain, time, so all those um, distilleries like Tomatin and Delwini. And Blair. Have you been to the island? I know I said we up top have been, but I'm wondering when's the last time you were on Vancouver Island? Uh, the last time I was there was uh, two years ago. Uh, I didn't make it up to Shelter Point. Uh, Davin did that round, um, yeah. but I did a lot of the uh, Victoria area and up into the northern area of Victoria and around the coast. Okay. And I'm going to ask you another question, Blair. I'm sorry. Uh, Shelter Point's picturesque. You go online, you look at everything. The place is beautiful. They've got stuff everywhere. I'm wondering if there's other places like this with that type of spectacular view that you saw when you did your book. And which book? That book right there. And we didn't do our plug for Father's Day yet, Blair. Father's yeah. Day. Yeah. If, if I don't know. It's, it's 9 o'clock here. Um, so if you didn't go out and buy your father this book, you kind of blew it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but stores open tomorrow, you can you can make it up then. Well, you can buy them the digital copy too, right? That's yeah, good. yeah, you can buy the digital copy. But um, yeah, when you look at pictures of Shelter Point, uh, it's it is a rare distillery in Canada still. Um, yeah. There's a lot of beautiful spots, um, but. Um, with that kind of scenery and that kind of, of operation and, and those kind of stills, uh, they're far and few between. 
Right. But with that okay. said, there's there's still um, uh, several several distilleries in Canada that have their own charm. Uh, like if you go out oh, yeah. to the uh, east coast and you see somewhere like the Newfoundland Distillery, uh, they're right on the water um, off Conception Bay to the point where if you go out the window, you'll fall in the water and get wet. Like they're right yeah. up on the shore. Um, yeah, there's there's cool. lots of great spots in Canada. And how far is Shelter Point from the water? Because we see the pictures, but we don't see it with the water in the background. Yeah, about a kilometer. So we're, we have three kilometers of ocean front on our property. But it, it sounds we, like just a great place to go. And uh, if we show up, can we go camping on your on your property? Absolutely. We can make that happen. We'll give it a free up the right to yeah. if you pay yourself. Yeah, I mean, well, bring an RV and we could park the IV. We just need a little plug and, and we could be there for a very long time, I think. Perfect. You camp different than I do. <laughs> okay. Well, you can sit in the little tent outside. I'll stay in the camper. I'm all right. I'm a city boy, Dave. <laughs> I like I like my amenities, man. You, my grandparents, my grandparents are from Shemana, so yeah. I'm an uh, island guy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Dave. No, just saying you know, my grandparents were from the island, so I was born out there. So you have a place to go no matter what. So well, I guess you're not from there and at your place. Yeah. Jacob and Leon, uh, how does the fresh air or being close to the ocean, because I'm guessing the temperature might well change, cold to hot, cold to hot, how does that affect the aging in the barrels? And do you get any salt on the barrels like we talk about it in things off of Isla? Anything like that going on or things you have to care about? I, I wasn't quite sure until uh, we released the rye last year. And then yeah. I, I was absolutely convinced that where the warehouse is matches hugely to the, the flavor of the whiskey. Okay. Um, we, we picked up salt and these multi aromas from the warehouse, which were very different to rye matured in Alberta because we originally got the spirit from our Alberta distillers and we had it here for about nine years or so. Oh. And the difference was huge. And it was all down to maturation. And that was the only possible difference. I and mean, it's the same kind of casks, uh, same spirit, but two completely different climates between uh, Calgary and Vancouver Island. And you get this lovely saltiness coming through um, because most of our warehouses are malt whiskey. They actually yep. got a lot of the malt whiskey flavor coming through to the right, even though there's no malted barley in the mash. It's interesting. Uh, that whiskey has definitely been a one that's convinced me about components, and it really doesn't matter what you make your whiskey. Wow. So I got a question here. Going back to last week and talking about the BC distillers, craft distillers thing. So if you brought whiskey in from Alberta doesn't fit into the craft dealers, uh, distillers program, does it? No. So we're, uh, we have some non-compliant whiskey in our warehouse. We were grandfathered in to that rule just because the craft policy came out four years after we were founded. So we were able to keep what we had done previously and had to more stick to that policy. So we still really still have some of that non-compliant whiskey. We release it sporadically every, every year and uh no craft is attached to whiskey so you're paying full markup and stuff like that so you have to pay full markup on that versus uh bc grown yeah okay and yeah only in the market. market uh it scales up from i think it starts at 124 percent and it can get all get up, get up all the way to 174 percent somewhere in there <laughs> the castery stuff, yeah. We send more of that stuff outside of BC. It's oh, more it's one, one, one fifty-eight. Uh, well, no. <laughs> uh, Blair, how about off of the Great Lakes? Same type of. I know there's no salt <laughs> off of the Great Lakes, but I'm wondering what's the influence of something off of just a massive body of water? Because there's got to be. Well, there are distilleries off Great Lakes. What can you tell us? That's a that's a good question. Um, whether or not it affects the maturation, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, okay. 
but you look at um, uh, in the East Coast, uh, a lot of distilleries are, aren't at the point where Shelter Point is right now with having these mature stocks. They're just getting started. So you're, right. you're not going to see that influence yet. Um, but, but you see them making gins and they're, they're bringing ingredients like uh, kelp and uh, seaweed to get, to get that maritime feel to it. Um, okay. And then you look at a, a distillery like Authentic Seacoast in, uh, in Nova Scotia. They're right on the coast. And um, they're aging next to the next to the ocean. They're doing a lot of finishing, um, and you might get a bit of that brightness, but um, I think it's more of a romantic notion of being by the sea. Yeah. Oh, for us. Or yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. Good. And of course, uh, for, for guys, yeah. Leon, I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm wondering about the uh, the craft production agreement. Did you think it helped you starting off before so you could get grandfathered in? Or do you think it would have been easier if you guys waited a couple of years to start? Well, it's always better to start here. The first move for advantage is huge. I think especially with whiskey. Oh, we've lost it. Barriers to entry in whiskey. It's a long time to get to uh, you know, a position of good stocks and especially good matured stocks. So the, the sooner you start, the better. You can get ahead of everyone else. Yeah. It doesn't really matter about craft or commercial licenses. This is all just government regulation and stuff. The thing that's really going to separate you from the rest of the industry um, is the great spirit you're putting out. And that will overcome any obstacle in terms of like, regulation, craft, or commercial. Excellent. I'm, I'm, this sounds really bad, but I'm going to ask you to try to come back. I'm going to do something else. I've, I'm going to make a suggestion just like Blair had to do before he came in because I'm still getting about every fifth word and I really want to hear what you have to say. Uh, click off of this. Can you close the browser completely? Restart the browser and then come back in? Yeah. Could you try that for us, guys? I'm sorry. I feel bad asking, but I'd rather hear them. Am I the only one? So, not no, no, no. they're... They're breaking up. Is it, I, is it too, uh, too much Wi-Fi connection too? That's just not handling yeah. the through. So is okay. it too much information on 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 a system that can't handle it? Yes. Like like last night we had those a couple of the gals. They took their pictures off, but we had their their audio, and that worked fine. But when the picture came on, it was it was it was a bit of a mess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they're just on a, a weak Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, problem. too much information on a small band or something. Or maybe two people on the computer side by side. That should be okay, well, though, right? That, that would have it's no effect. Okay. All right. We could have 50 people on this side of the camera. It would be. It's, well, just, it's one camera. Let's talk about something because all my questions I wanted for them was about the startup of their distillery and how they decided on the different malts and the different stills. And did Leon have a part of that and what Jacob's job was? So we'll get to all of that. But let's talk about a little bit about the whiskey in front of us because we can do that and they can catch up on that really easily. Because, well, they make it. So I've got the mall fall, guys, in front of yes. me. Sure That's I. Cool. All right, what do you think? And it's this I one thought, right there. I thought a little. I thought I got a little hint of sherry right off the bat, and on the first sip, uh, raisins hit me right off the right off the right off the taste. Okay, yeah, I, I thought it was dark. something there because well, I was the same way. Yeah, it had a very sweet front end on it, but it was very fleeting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I got I got a mint. There's a picture. How's that? Well, that's We're a, not even cut off. You got the picture that's between. An awesome you. picture. That's awesome. You're getting better. Don't you learn how to do this all of a sudden? Uh, slightly better. I, I have a little bit of time. Anyway, so that's a beautiful looking picture too. We that we don't. Is. I don't get the same color they get on there, but I'm really impressed with it. I don't know if I get sherry notes, but I do get like we usually think dark fruit with sherry, but vanilla. Uh, this guy is. Is it unmalted? I think it's triple distilled. It is triple distilled and all unmalted barley. So it's, it's oh wow! Like, so it's like an well, it's like we're drinking a an Irish whiskey. Yeah. yeah. So just really quick, I'm gonna read this until our our friends come back. So uh, the 141 lot 141 Malfall District 
is truly unique field to flask whiskey. The name is the very lot in which the single grain barley was grown. And the coordinates of the exact field are included on every bottle. So the coordinates are on this bottle somewhere. So this one is a, a current release? Golf? Right in the back. Yeah, this is one of their very newest releases. I don't know if you can see the latitude and longitude on there. I'm yeah. trying not to shake it too much. It, it, it's but there, it, but, but click that into uh, Google Earth, and it'll just kind of zoom right in for you. It's kind of cool. So I like that. I like. Did you try that? Golf? Did you actually enter the coordinates? No, I'm too lazy. It actually, was. Laura wouldn't know how to do it. My lovely wife, but we'll do it, no, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it. Or we'll Google do it map. after Dram, and I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen, and we could see if that works out. Because that's where we're going to do our funny things on that. And distilled, same thing, copper pots in aged American and French oak. Both of our expressions tonight are in French oak. Uh, the double barrel, though, is not French oak. The double barrels in, uh, it is French oak, but it's double distilled. And it's malted and unmalted barley for that one. So Boy, some what a beautiful you know, picture you have. I like that tasting dining room picture you just had. Wouldn't that be yeah. fantastic? That yeah. would be awesome yeah. to go yeah. and sit there and have Imagine supper. the tasting we could do there. <laughs> Davin could get a table all to yeah. himself. He would, <laughs> That's <laughs> how he rolls. He, he does. He likes it. So, uh, no, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful place. So, and so that's the one. Yeah. And the second one. Call dibs on your table. Yeah. Well, go in first. That's what we do. Uh, so let's hope those guys come in in a bit. And I'm going to go yeah. to something else because, uh, yeah, what am I going to do? I had questions for everybody. I have questions for Davin. <coughs> I have after dram questions for Blair. And I don't know. So do you have any idea which still that was made in, the 5,000, 4,000, or the 1,000 liter still? No, it just said the names of the type of still. So it's and it didn't say no. Okay. It did not. Custom I'm design copper pot still is all they say. And triple distill. I'm curious. How do you decide between distilling between a five thousand and the four thousand liter? And then going to the thousand. I mean, I can see the thousand for a smaller batch, but so we have a question for Blair here from Sheila. Uh Blair, you mentioned people are using kelp in their gin on the East Coast. Is anyone using kelp or Duluth in their kiln processing? Oh, thank you. Uh, not that I know. Of. <laughs> yeah, no, a, a lot of the distilleries on the East Coast um, are still making their whiskey, so it's tough to say what they're planning on doing, but I don't know anyone using uh, uh, seaweed or kelp as a, as a, as a drying agent. Mm. Well, How did drying Shelton would that be? What's that? Pardon me? I said, how briny would that be? How salty and I'm, someone had to have tried it at one point yeah. in time. I assume so. A lot of the gins, uh, like they, they really, it's really, um, they don't go overboard with it. They really layer it in because it is something that you could really blow out. Um, I think they just, uh, like if you look at somewhere like San Leonardo Distillery with their gin, uh, they're just bringing in these, these, um, seaweed tones to to elevate that uh, brininess and uh, same with the newfoundland distillery with their seaweed gin they're they're it's all layered in balanced and um and delic delicately delicately treated okay well didn't there's didn't more. shelter there's... Point, didn't shelter point say they use sea cucumbers oh i don't know when i, Online. When yeah. I was reading somebody said sea cucumbers today and and I'm sure it was Shelter Point. Yeah. And I don't and know what a secret. They're online. So you looked on their, their online stuff, their their homepage. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure well, that's I where I got the information yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. And I need someone else. Uh, Blair, I know that Davin did this, but they have the 1,000 liter. It's a mechanical pot, but with, uh, with the plates in it. And we saw, we were talking about a distillery like that. Lock Loman has that too. There's a gigantic. Mm -hmm. So this... I'm wondering how that works and why they would have a pot still with the plates. Can you talk to that? No, that's something that we'd have to ask Shelter Point. Because that's really kind of cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, yeah. Our heavier, more oily uh, single malts we make, we, we run with the plates either, 
they're, they're closed. So, so the plates don't come into effect. So for the lighter whiskeys, we will open some of the plates up. So you get some, some reflux going on in there. So it depends on what we're looking for. So you want to so lighten on, the whiskey? Yeah. Cause it gets distilled a little more. Okay. And of course I'm in, I'm in sales. So I only, I only kind of take a little bit of what I'm told. And here's the other question then, if it's the thousand liter, as opposed to the two larger ones, what's the different flavors coming out of that? You figure. Hey, Jacob Leon. How is it in the room? How is it now? Is it better? Oh, hey. Hey, guys. Yeah. Wow. And we yeah. can actually even see you this time. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> well, I'm fine. Getting settled. Dave and I were having a discussion about the stills and I just want to say shelter points on page 62 of the book. If anyone's following along, Page 62 with these two guys there and some guys in that book right there. Uh, the question was, uh, in your 1,000-liter mechanical pot still that has the 20 plates in it, when are you using that specifically? And what's the difference between that and your the two large ones? Okay, so the, the two large ones, that's your traditional pot stills from yeah. Forsyth's in Rothis in Scotland. Yeah. Um, they're just like what you would find in a lot of Scottish distilleries, four and 5,000 litre stills. Uh, we got the specific mechanical still with the 20 plate column specifically for gin and vodka production. Okay. Because the more size stills are great for making whiskey, but they're not very good for making kind of neutral spirits. And when you're making vodka and gin, you want like a nice neutral base. Um, so with the 20 plate column still, we can actually get up to 95% alcohol and just make a very clean backbone for our white spirits. Uh, with the double distillation on the four size stills, we end up with around 72, 73% alcohol. Uh, and that's good for our spirit. All right, perfect. Uh, Jacob, I'm gonna re-ask you two questions because we didn't really hear it before. One, where are you from specifically in Scotland or Leon? And well, let's start with that. Then I'll go to Jacob's question. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. So, Leon, again, what were you doing before you came to Canada? All right. Um, drinking loads of whiskey, mostly. Good for you, sir. Good for you. Um, yeah. There's some great bars in Scotland, like the Diggers. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit close to Heart of Midlothian Football Club, which is a horrible place. Just don't go anywhere there. But, you know, there's like a permanent whiskey festival at this pub. There's 40 whiskeys. 35 mil measures, so your larger measures, and they're all £2.50 each. Oh my. Um, I, I just spent a lot of time in places like that, and, and I, I grew, grew up like really appreciating whiskey, and then okay. after 10 years of, of banking, I thought, right, I need to change this. I'm not really enjoying sure. myself. I might as well follow my passion. Um, so I retrained at Harriet Watt University. I uh, did the same degree that Gordon Glanz did, who you were speaking to last time. Yeah. Uh, so a year master's and then, uh, yeah, for my master's project, I worked at um, Isla Harris Distillery and create the, helped create the Isla Harris gin. Uh, and then I did the Kintyre gin in Scotland. And then after that, uh, my wife's Canadian. So we moved out to Canada to start making spirits out here. Beautiful. Thank so you. where is she from? She's from Kitsilano, where? Vancouver. Uh, oh, okay. So you grew up like 14th and Barad, um, so it's a beautiful yeah. place to visit. And uh, I've been visiting BC since 2000, and I've always felt like I've had two homes. I've had Scotland and I've had Canada. So it's, it's really nice to get the best out of both places. I think you're well so, situated you, you, for both, buddy. That's great. You, you, uh, you do have a green card, right? I've got a permanent resident card. Uh, next step is the passport. I think I'm, I'm ready now. So I'll, I'll get my um, red Mountie costume on. And I'll, I'll sing the song about beavers and trees. And uh, I'm sure I think Dave just wants to get you deported because two brewers doesn't like the competitions. <laughs> <laughs> but of all the Settle down know, there, Dave, buddy. It's good. Be nice to These are one of our favorites. Well, oh. They are. Uh, Jacob, Jacob, tell us about yourself and your job there because we didn't get any of that before. Yeah. Uh, I showed up on the farm in like 2010. Um, Patrick likes to say I just followed a brunette home from school. Good. As uh, <laughs> I, uh, daughter, I hope Was I married one of his daughters. Uh, I started off working in the farm. I actually I came here as a carpenter. I I came to build a barn, and then I just never left. Okay. So I 
I rebuilt the warehouse that we're actually in right now. And then I built the uh, another barn on the farm. Yeah, show, show the, you can show the warehouse that we're in. 3,000 nice. almost. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. And then uh, I took over the farm in 2012. Uh, we used to do commercial raspberries that we'd sell yeah. to uh, seniors. And then I uh, took over sales in 2015, took over the warehouse in 2016. And then I started managing late 2016 just the whole operation to help Patrick out. Um, in the time I put myself through business school and gave Patrick a couple of grandkids and, and just sort of settled in and <laughs> very crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to just show up to get a job, but to keep a job or move up, you have to start become, become well, you have to be family. That's it. Yeah. Family. No, I don't think anybody here actually applied, like, answered any resume or any job applications. We all just sort of showed up and like, like here, like let's just hang out and see what happens. We, we, we don't believe in TVs, it's just how your armpits smell. Yeah, like how so. hard would you work? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And uh, Jacob, you have a re well, I don't do we call it a restaurant or do we call it a tasting room? What you have in there, and I'm wondering, it's were you here. there's no food service or anything like that, just okay. uh, just a tasting area, unless there's weddings or something, right? That you there's weddings, are. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we used to do about three weddings a week um, to help pay the bill at the beginning because there's not a lot of, of income when you start making whiskey. It's just a lot of hurry up and wait. And when we started, we, we didn't do clear spirits. So we never intended to, to make vodka or gin. So we were just committed to spending all of our money and having no return for about <laughs> five years. Yeah. So we, <laughs> Patrick likes to say we pimped out the distillery to weddings. So we used to do about three a week. Uh, now we don't do any. Because weddings are very stressful and people are always yelling at us, and it's just not that enjoyable. Okay, I got it. I got it's it. Too bad because it's a very nice area. Oh yeah, yeah. that's a. We'll have that's a couple weddings that are smooth, and then one that's just horrible. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, we have a place. It's called Farm to Fork here, uh, where everything comes off the farm and goes into a restaurant area, and something like that in that area, I could just see going over very well. Yeah. It's, uh, it's always down the down the road. We always have lots of plans. It's just getting approval and then going forward. Well, Twenty years down the road, that's what you're doing. Maybe you'll yeah. be weddings every day. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> you guys can just separate yourselves from everyone, though. That's yeah. okay. You have a wall. <laughs> All right. I'm really yeah. interested. I'm really interested in how well distillery is kind of going green we talked about it last week with the odd spirits they have the fully contained cooling system saves tons on water and you guys seem to be really proud of what you're doing with ducks unlimited so you can see that all over the website as well can you tell me uh how that came to be with the ducks unlimited that's one thing and not any of the other green stuff you do yeah the ducks unlimited thing is pretty straightforward uh patrick has had a long relationship with ducks unlimited uh, since he was a kid, just their family farm always partnered with them. So uh, once they wanted to expand on some land that we had got when we uh, when we purchased this property, kids, it came with uh, 400 acres on the ocean. And then it also came with about a thousand just 20 minutes away. So we donated some of that in which they, they created a couple parks and a hatchery and whatnot. And we've just been working with them as much as possible, uh, just right from the get go. They're just a lovely partner to have. And. And it just works out for everybody. And then you yeah. can talk to the distillery side. Yeah, we've got green fields. Does that count? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's yeah, lots of water. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the water comes from an aquifer under our feet. So there's this huge aquifer. And we've got three wells around the farm. And the water's beautiful. It's just absolutely stunning water. Uh, it's all glacial fed from the mountains here, like Mount Washington around there. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, like we've discovered things when, when when you farm and you distill, there's a whole cycle. There's a cycle of life. And and you once you finish mashing, you take all that spent barley, the draft, and then you spread it over the fields or you spread it over your raspberry rows. And we've noticed that you get this huge increase in yield um, because you're essentially putting nutriment back into the ground and you get a lot of microbial activity. Um, so there's this whole cycle and it's really beneficial, you know, you just get like better barley every year 
and that helps you make more whiskey and then you get more draft and then you put it back in and it's just beautiful. And then at the same time, you've got all the bears and the eagles around the farm. It's a very wild, beautiful place. And this is one of the things I admire most about Patrick. He, he wants to keep it wild and special. Like you could easily like build a few hotels along the front or something and cash in, but he, yeah. he realizes just how special this property is and how it's like one of the last coastal farms in BC. Uh, a real stunning place. It's like two kilometers of coastline. There's about 380 acres. It's very wild. Like when I was still in Scotland, you don't see bears running through the property. Like there's some days when I'm trying to get back to my house on the farm and I have to take a different route because there's a bear in the way. So, you know, it's, it's very wild out here. It's very stunning. Well, you can push your way through, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got a motorbike. So that's pretty good at scaring them off. I just give them a few revs and that does the job. So we're helping the environment by drinking your whiskey is what you're saying. Essentially, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the greenest way to drink, drink whiskey, especially Shelter Point. Thank you very much. I like that. Oh, we've got Davin. Davin, yeah, Davin here. Yeah, Davin right. here. <laughs> Welcome, Davin. How are you? We're doing well. The legend. <laughs> the legend. Davin, we're going to have you introduce yourself, please, for our 12 viewers right now, but everyone else that comes back later. Maybe they don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Davin de Kergamo. I... Uh, have been writing about whiskey for well since the late 1990s. Uh, have uh, written, I guess, the the book, uh, definitive guide to Canadian distilleries, along with uh, with Blair Phillips, who I can see in the upper right hand corner there. I uh, I've written a few other books. I wrote a Canadian whiskey book uh, quite some time ago, May 2012, and. Uh, then, then they went and started a whole bunch of new uh, micro distilleries. So we had to do an update and added about, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 micro distilleries to that. And then uh, Blair and I, working together on Whiskey Magazine, decided we needed a separate book for the 257 micro distilleries in Canada. And so uh, Blair and I put that one together. Anyways, I've been writing about whiskey for quite a long time, and I have to say I'm in a pretty good mood because uh, uh, Jacob sent me some of this uh, this hand sanitizer. <laughs> the sanitizer. You don't need to provide these notes, Darwin. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, we don't. But but uh, I was telling my wife she's got to stop using that stuff when she wipes down the counter in the kitchen because I'm just getting this this urge to lick it. It smells like barley. We just <laughs> we just, really? we, just bought, we just bought six more bottles of it. It's uh, it's Remember, we, we emptied barrels to make some of that stuff, so <laughs> yeah. that's we wanted to help. It was a very like uh, difficult moment for us because you know you, you want to make as much whiskey as possible, but we also <laughs> wanted to help people in the medical services and all that. So, yeah, it was it was tricky. Yeah, well, you're yeah. helping somebody in Ottawa who's in the whiskey services because uh, our house is is uh, absolutely uh, completely germ free and smells <laughs> wonderful. Just yes. awesome. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm late here tonight. I uh, I was doing a tasting with the Ottawa Whiskey Guild, and we were tasting a bunch of bunch of Canadian whiskey. So that's nice. so. Do you still have yeah. theirs in your glass, or do you have something else, Devin? I still have theirs in my glass, but I wouldn't mind pouring something new. Oh, we can wait. Well, yeah, I'd like to know how that sanitizer tastes. So you just know, gonna find out if you want while you're pouring. I was going to ask uh, Leon a question about water because Leon, you were saying how the water, well, the natural springs, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called when it comes from underneath the water? It's uh, a natural what? Aquifer. Aquifer. Thank you. How is that? I really don't know how to tell how a water will influence a spirit. Now we talk about it and we talk about the natural springs and how other <laughs> good job there, Jake. How, how does the water react with the spirit? And can you tell what's gonna happen based on the type of water? If you have soft water, heavy water, spring, fresh water, frozen glacier water. Well, it, you know, every water has a different character, and I think it's one of the parts of whiskey production that's very like under glamorized like it should be there should be more attention on water like i, I remember in like, space I, when i went swimming next to my house in the, the spay river one of the fastest flowing rivers in all of the uk there's like 
this brownness to it. There was so much like peat in the water. Like you opened your eyes under the water and it was just brown. Uh, or at least it was the peat anyway. Um, so it, <laughs> anyway, it's beautiful, soft water. And um, it, it, it's like anything, like what you put in is what you get out. So the taste of water, like how does the water taste? And, um, you know, it, it should be like a blind tasting that people do. You should take water from like different places and taste the water and see what you like best. Uh, because that's a key ingredient in any whiskey is the water. Um, so and take that, it, take that a little, can I, can, I ask a, can I ask a question here? So do you have to do a lot of treating to the water or is it just the water goes straight into uh, distillation? Almost nothing, almost nothing. Like okay. all our water is like filtered by rocks and natural processes. Um, all we do is put it through a particulate filter and that's about it. Yeah. We, and we have it tested every year and it's just, it always comes out great. So you guys said you had a couple wells on site? Yeah. Do you yeah. do any uh, geothermal through those wells for cooling or anything like that? Do you? No. Well, we, we, we use the aquifer water for cooling our um, Sills, so it goes through the condenser, and, and we're quite lucky because we've got this free water source. Like, if you have a, a distillery in a city, it can be very expensive in terms of like sourcing city water and then taking the chlorine out and putting it through all these filters and reverse osmosis and all these things. We don't have to do any of that. Like, all the water is below our feet in this huge aquifer. We take it out, we put it through a particulate filter, and, and we're putting like 60 gallons a minute through our condensers. You know, they're, they're very water hungry things these condensers so uh we we get all this water for free and it really helps us keep a lower cost base which helps us have more competitive pricing in terms of our final product nice. so if you're doing 60 gallons a minute are you distilling seven days a week five days a week uh we're currently we're just still in 10 shifts a week so we do like double shift in five days a week weekends off okay. good job yeah <laughs> Although I did work today, so okay, I was going to say we're impinging upon your weekend off. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, David and Blair, question for you, gentlemen. Let's go with the water question. Have you noticed a different flavor because of the water, possibly in the different distilleries you've been to? I'm just wondering if you can connect the flavor of the whiskey to water, possibly somewhere. I think you may get some effect from the dilution water but you know i mean they they purify the water i mean they i remember talking to harold ferguson who runs uh, uh canadian mist or used to run canadian mist distillery and he said what he would do is he would use the purest water he could get because you can adjust everything else you can raise the ph you can lower the ph you know you can add minerals you can take minerals out he would he says that he would use pure water i have not personally been able to detect a certain kind of water. And I think there's a little bit of uh, marketing involved there in that people say that whatever water uh, they have at their distillery, there's some reason why it's the best water. So, you know, like in, in Scotland, you know, at, at Glenmorangie, they, they're the hard water they use at Glenmorangie, that's the best thing. That's one of the reasons why their whiskey is so fabulous. And then you go to uh, to Kentucky, and you don't get the you get the limestone water, which is quite alkaline. You know that's the best thing for making whiskey. You know, and I, you know I think that they, it, much of it is just you know uh, making a virtue out of out of a necessity. Uh, I think that what, really what you want to do is uh, get water that that is uh, clean and uh, adjust it so that it, it, the enzymes work it. You know, to the optimum with that pH, and the, the yeast works optimum with that uh, with that pH, which might mean doing some adjustments like that. But I think that really, um, I haven't noticed any differences. But I think that that Leon gives a much better explanation, and uh, quite honestly, I'd take his word over mine uh, any day. On, any day, all right. On use of water, I remember that, Devin, and uh, perfect. <laughs> That's a good segue to our next question, which is going directly to Leon anyway. So, Leon, uh, were you involved at the very beginning when, well, the large pot stills, they're developing with uh, Forsyth and Roth. Do you, did you have a say in what type of still, or do you know what they were expecting out of their spirit and how that influenced the stills they picked? First, were you there? And two, do you know? I've only been here like three years 
they'll okay. get be here. So uh, the, the guy that actually helped set up the story in terms of uh, whiskey production process and stuff. Um, yeah. Well, too, there's James Marnus. He's the other distiller still working here. He's been with Patrick for 30 years. Uh, lots wow. of experience and you know, a great guy. Uh, he's got Dutch heritage, so he's very tall. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but part of who trained him was Mike Nicholson, and Mike Nicholson of sort of Lagavulin fame. Um, so uh, I'm sure when they were setting up, they probably had some consulting advice in terms of like what kind of still would work best for producing the desired flavor profile. Uh, but I missed out on all that bit, so I don't know the details. Yeah, so I can ask you. Well, can you be privy to some oh, backroom conversations at night after you drink your new make a little bit too much and just something that came out? So, uh, why don't we see what Jacob has to say about that? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, originally Patrick went and toured Scotland for about three weeks uh, with his uh, father and James. And then they just got, uh, they were just asking every distillery they went into uh, on their thoughts on their, on their stills. So then when we went to Forsyth, uh, he already had a pretty good idea of the single malt style he wanted. And he just sort of named a couple of distilleries somewhere in between these two. And then they sort of designed the stills from there uh, to a point. And some of it is you're picking out of a catalog uh, a little bit as well when you're there. Like they have only so many options. Yeah. And it was just about the size that we wanted to do, the water that we had and, and what our future looked like. So Jake, you guys what type of spirit were you thinking that you guys wanted at the beginning? Did, did they ever talk about that, what they thought they were going to get, and it changed maybe, and they and then they're on a different path? Uh, it was always about just making single malt scotch-style whiskey. That was always the goal, um, you know, somewhere more of a Highland style opposed to some of the other styles, but that was always the idea and the goal. I think they took a kind of like risk-free approach Yeah, because it's, it's kind of like a medium height still, a uh, slightly downward sloping line arm, so... Yeah. But nothing extreme, you know. It's it's just like kind of like middle ground for everything. It's not like Glen Morangy, like super tall <laughs> stills, or is. like the wee witchy yeah. at Mortlock with a, a tiny little stumpy still. You know, <laughs> it's, it's all kind of like middle ground. Um, but it does produce a beautifully balanced spirit. So John Jameson has a question, which also leads into one that I have for you. Uh, where do you get your American air, uh, American oak barrels from, and is it from JD? A lot of them are from JD. Um, we also buy from Maker's Mark and Buffalo Trace. Uh, we have some from Freud in here as well. And uh, a couple of sherry butts that came from Brook Laddie. And whatever we get our hands on, we're willing to try once. <laughs> and and the, the small point was a sensation as well. We managed to get our hands on 187 ex Lafroig quarter casks. Nice. And when's so, your next smoke point? Because that didn't come to Edmonton up here. We were looking for it. We have yeah. three guys here that would have bought it right away. Yeah, we're working on that right now. Uh, we actually, Leon and I, just have it all added together. So now we're just going through the next stage, which is going to be picking the ABV we want to bottle at. So we'll do a couple of blind tastings with everybody and, and see what, the, what comes back as the best uh, ABV. And then once that's chosen, uh, you water it down about 2% per week. So we're probably late summer, mid-summer, it'll be released. And it's going to be a bigger batch than your, uh, last year. So right. you should see some in Edmonton. Uh, if not, I know that it's going to be in Calgary. So yeah. there's one. <laughs> so hey, we'll offer services for blind tasting and uh, we'll you know return notes in favor. Okay, oh, we yeah. can make that happen. We're always looking for new tasting notes. <laughs> there you go. So, can I ask a question? Is this a peated whiskey, or is it a smoked whiskey? Or because of the BC uh, craft distillers rules, you can't bring something in from outside of BC to to make it a, a peated whiskey. So, is this a smoked whiskey that you're doing? It's it's uh, neither. Uh, so there's no peat in the mash. And it's just putting a, a blend of malt spirit and unmalted spirit and just finishing them off in Lafroy barrels for a oh, year. Finishing them. Yeah, so they spent four years in American oak and then about a year in the Lafroy casks. And that's where all the peat influence comes from. Yeah. So I was, I was last week, I was a little disappointed in the BC Distillers program that tells you what you can and can't do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it kind of tied your guys' hands when it comes to smoky, smoky whiskeys. No, absolutely. That's how why we had to source the the Lafroy barrels originally. 
Um, but yeah. sort of a mad scientist. So we're we're working on smoking our own barley right now. Um, there's a little farm near us, so we're gonna go dig that up uh, in the next couple months, nice. and then just uh, just make our own smoker and see what happens. Try not yeah, to burn. Well, somebody, <laughs> somebody's gonna be smoking salmon around there somewhere, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, we smoke salmon all the time, so it's just incorporating that into the barley. Somehow, yeah. When they're not when they're not doing the fish, you just get some uh, some barley in there. Yeah, we'll make it happen. We're yeah. fish barley. Yeah. The ultimate yeah. dream. We talked about yeah. this when you were offline for a little bit. So this was the mall fall, the the lot one forty one. We talked about it. Uh, we had some sherry notes on it. We thought it's no sherry bottles, but sherry notes, and we thought it was just the dark fruit. Do you have anything that you would add about the one forty one? Something you like a lot. Something well, that was different. interesting because it was uh, aged. Uh, a lot of the whiskey in that was aged in French oak, blackberry, port style. Oh, there that we go. All right. So oh, I wasn't oh. wrong this time. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here, a question for Davin. Um, were you part of that group the other night with Andrew Ferguson where they did all the? Um, yeah. Yes, I was. Yeah. Like Mumford District Lot One Four One came out ahead of like a 42 year old Canadian club. Could you explain a little bit about what happened there? <laughs> Good question. Well, we tasted, not. we tasted seven really wonderful whiskeys. We tasted the Montfort 141 first, and it really was, uh, was quite, um, uh, it was huge, it was bold. It had those notes like wine gums or jelly beans or something like that on that. And it, it really made a big impression. And people enjoyed that whiskey. And you know, when we're tasting, you know, we like to go, I like to go back and forth and take, you know, you taste something and compare it to this and compare it to that. And you know, when you compare it to a different whiskey, you pull new notes out of out of the out of the whiskey you've tasted. And um, generally what we then asked people what was their were their two favorite whiskeys. And it was uh, for just about everybody. It was the Montfort uh, and something else. And uh, for me, it, it was the Montfort and the uh, the Canadian uh, Club forty uh, two year old. But the other whiskeys were all really really fine. So then they they've got this secret ballot thing they can do, and you, they say what name your top two whiskeys, and people just you know tick the the, the box. And when the vote was over, I think it was like sixty eight percent. Uh, shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that, that is kind of remarkable. Uh, that that blew away like a, a four-year-old whiskey uh, being preferred to like a forty-two-year-old. Like that, that's just yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? I mean, they're, they're so different. Uh, yeah. Honestly, they that yeah. forty-two-year-old whiskey is uh, a remarkable whiskey, and it's really it's worth ten times what you pay for it. Uh, but I think that it's just that. The Montfort uh, Lot 141 was so, it's such a big whiskey. It's got all mm. that fruit. It's got all that lusciousness on it. And people uh, just were really, were really drawn to it. I, I get like a really strong black forest ghetto cake note. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, some people were noticing chocolate on it as well. It, <laughs> I'm glad you saw that. That was pretty... Uh, yeah, I, I was I was blown away. I was just completely surprised. I was like, ah, oh, we're probably like third or fourth or something like that. You know, I wasn't expecting us to be ahead of some of these more established distilleries that have much older stock. Did Andrew call you or send you a an well email? He's on Twitter. It was all on Instagram. It was all shared on social media. He did. He did message me and let me know after all the results yeah. came in. Oh, good for him. Yeah. Uh, well, he's an active guy online. You see him everywhere, right? Uh, gentlemen, let's let's. If you haven't already delved into the double barrel, we can do that. Uh, our time's going a little bit short, but I want to have this now before I go on to the, our what are they called cocktail in the after dram. Double barrel cocktail guy. So this is this is where my enjoyment comes in right here. Ah, uh, and same thing. And uh, now this one double distilled. The mouthful was triple distilled. And unmalted barley, right? This yeah. one malted and unmalted. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, did you have to cook them all? I mean, the barley. No. Um, the for, for, it's basically like an Irish style whiskey. So it's fifty percent malted, fifty percent unmalted. 
If we do 100% unmalted, then we use exogenous enzymes because obviously there's okay. not enough enzymes um, within the barley itself. Uh, but if you have enough percentage of malted barley, then you don't need to add any exogenous yeah. enzyme. Yeah. Okay. And that's a small percentage too. So you didn't want to do that? You didn't want to have the malted barley in it whatsoever? You just want a 100? Uh, for, for the month, right. we wanted the provenance, so it was all about taking barley from one field on the farm. Um, there was recent marketing from Waterford Distillery, and I really liked it because it was like single farm origin. Uh, that's mm. what it said on the on the bottle, and I think that applied here because we're, we're a farm distillery, and we can actually take barley or rye or wheat from one field, and then we can make a whiskey out of it. And part of our dream for the future is... Uh, taste the green bowl, where we're going to have like a malted wheat, a malted rye, a malted barley. So you almost be able to buy a three pack. You yep. know, and they'll, they'll all be like five or six years old or something. But then you them side by side, and you can experience the different grains in their purest form. Uh, do a malted corn too. Oh, there right. you go. There you go. <laughs> they don't make corn. Last, last, last rod is a malted corn, and it's really quite taking. Yeah, I like well, it. Evan, we'll do it for, just for you. We'll <laughs> do a malted corn. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are you guys able to produce all your own barley, or do you have to buy from outside? We still bring it in from outside. We grow about 400 ton a year, thereabout. And then we use some of that for unmalted. Uh, we send some of that way, some of that away to Gambrinus to be malted for us. They'll do custom malts and... Uh, and then whatever else we need to, to supply for the rest of the year, we just bring in from Gambrinus. And Jacob, you're you're available online throughout Canada. Do you go outside of Canada? Uh, a little bit. So we're in Australia, uh, China, and Japan, and a little bit in the Netherlands. Um, and then I'm hoping to like not a little bit. Yeah, just well, they'll take a little bit. They don't they don't they don't take a lot each each area. Uh, Australia is our biggest supporter. Uh, they've nice. been with us since uh, day one. They, we had an importer fly from Australia, and he bought two pallets and left, and his credit card cleared, so it was really nice. <laughs> we come back every year, so we, we're very grateful for that. Uh, we plan on expanding down to the U.S. before COVID, so I'm not sure what the plan is right now for the rest of the year, but that's kind of the next step for us would be, be going down there. We'll probably hit the uh, uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, everybody. Uh, I'm going to leave it on that note for now. So this has been a fantastic start, gentlemen. It's been great. And I'm glad everyone's camera worked. I'm glad Davin finally got to us. It's yeah. a great night. But the time's going too fast. So I, I'm going to thank our listeners. I'm going to thank you six other gentlemen. It's been fantastic so far. So thank you, Jacob, Davin, Blair, Dave, Kent, Leon. Thank you for everything. And... We're going to be back. We're, we're coming back in about five minutes. We're moving our conversation from the distillery to your tasting room, which you don't serve food in, but that's okay. We'll just drink all night. It's fine. For some equally engaging conversation. So, Davin and co-author Blair Phillips of The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries, the portable expert to over 200 distilleries and the spirits they make, <laughs> will. <laughs> will, of course, be joining us as well. Because what better summer activity is there than traveling virtually and trying cocktails now and spending time with great people? So five minutes, ladies and gentlemen, gives us time to make our cocktails. And if not, and you will, you're going to come back, join us next Saturday and for the next 14, no, 13 weeks after this. We're, we're in for the long haul. We're, we're going all through the summer. There you go. We're loving it. Uh, next, I'm going to Utah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to the interior next. <laughs> into the interior. Oh, yeah. Interior next, Dublin, and then up to the Yukon, and then Alberta. So it's a long trail. But Davin, Davin planned the trip. We're doing it. Can yeah, anyone show them that picture of Shelter Point? Oh, I yeah. did too. With the contrails making San a St. Andrews Cross in the back. Oh, I love it. I love I love it. I it. I Isn't that awesome? Yeah, <laughs> that's I uh, the picture, but I didn't. That's on page it. sixty-three of the book. All right, <laughs> gentlemen, I'm logging us off. We'll be back in five minutes. Hopefully, everyone's back. Thank you for the afternoon. Thank you all so much, and.